Okay, let's talk about binocular vision and we're going to have an hour of BB fun and hopefully you're going to come away going, all right, I know what to do about this. So to look at a summary of, I need to turn this on. A summary of what we're going to go through is a two system approach to BB. Uh, to try and make it simple because if you think about all the possible BB problems it all gets really complex um, but if we just think about these two systems it gets a lot easier for you to assess and also manage the problems. We're going to talk about how PRISM is your friend. PRISM might terrify you a little bit but it's an amazing tool that you can use. We're going to talk about BB and contact lenses. Got to get some contact lenses in there and why BB matters and there's a few different reasons for that for um, for clinical problem solving for myopia control and also because of the great opportunities that, um, that we can offer our patients by actually understanding what's happening with their binocular vision. So the two system approach is essentially thinking about our aiming system and our focusing system and any of you who've done placement with me have heard me talk about aiming and focusing to patients. You will have heard me talk about the eyes being like a pair of binoculars. So this is how I explain it to patients. If you use binoculars, you've got to line the oculars up in front of your eyes and you have to adjust the focus. So in a similar way, we've got muscles outside our eyes that line our eyes up on the object of interest, that's our vergent system, and muscles on the inside of the eyes that adjust focus to make things clear. Both of those systems need to have stamina, they need to have stability, and we've got to be able to maintain those without fatigue. And we're going to talk about how you assess each of those, thinking about those two different systems. So these are essentially most of the tests we can do for a binocular vision assessment. And we group them into vergence tests, accommodation tests, and other. And some of them are obviously combinations of vergence and accommodation. These are slightly different things, but let's focus over here. So when we think of our foria for vergence, or we think of our fused cross sill or NERAT for accommodation, think of that like the posture of the system, where it sits in space. And then we, f we think about fusion reserves at NIA or our PRI, NRA or even things like our facility, our ability to clear plus and minus. Think of that like the petrol in the tank. Now, when I explain this to patients, I use the analogy of posture and actually show them. So if I've got a bad posture like this and I have strong muscles, so say for example I've got a big fat lag of accommodation but I have strong muscles, I can clear a lot of minus, I might not have symptoms. But if I've got a bad posture and I've got weak muscles, so say I've got a big lag and I can't clear minus, then I'm more likely to have symptoms. So that's the sort of thing we can look at. We're going to treat a kid with a big lag who can clear minus, maybe differently to the kid with a big lag who can't clear minus. Because one, both have a bad posture, but one has petrol in the tank or stamina to manage it and one doesn't. So think about our tests in establishing what's happening with this system where the posture is and how well they can control it, which is their petrol in the tank. And these tests obviously come into us working out if we've got suppression, and this is obviously the interaction between the two systems. So we're going to think about it this way, and we're going to go through a couple of cases just to understand what's normal and what isn't, and how we can put this approach into play. Now, these are my favourite tools, and I've got a couple of them here to play with. Um, hopefully all of you love your rat, maybe not as much as me, but you should learn to love your rat. And I know it's hard and it takes hours to do a ret right now, but keep practicing, keep practicing next to you when you graduate and it gets easier and easier. There's so much useful stuff you can figure out really quickly with your ret. Um, prison bars are amazing. I don't use that vertical, gu vertical guy very much, but if you don't have your own prison bar and you're interested in binocular vision, get yourself one. I don't think they're very expensive, um, but it's something you'll carry with you everywhere you go and it just gives you a really useful tool for BB assessment. Obviously our work for dots are useful if we're trying to figure out what level of BB problem we've got. And I've got a bunch of flippers we're going to talk about a little bit later on. So I think you guys order some flippers yourselves normally, plus ones and plus twos. Um, we're going to talk about some of the other ones that you can get. Do you have a plus or minus 150? Awesome, that is so useful for rat. We'll talk about them later on because they're just key in being able to do these assessments easily. So when we're trying to diagnose problems with these systems, to put it simply, either of these systems can be underactive, overactive, or both. And then when we put the particular problems into the boxes, an underactive vergent system is exophoria, or a convergence insufficiency. An overactive vergence problem is esophoria, or convergence excess. And if they're both lousy, that's an infacility or an inflexibility problem. In the same way, accommodation can be underactive, overactive, or both. So if it's underactive, we're going to have problems with minus, that means an accommodation insufficiency. 
It's an, if it's overactive, we'll have problems clearing plus, that's an accommodative excess. And if both are lousy, that's an infacility or a spasm. So when you think of it that way, there's only six things that can go wrong with the BB system. And any of these can be in combination with any others. Generally, there'll be some sort of status of the verge system, one of three, and some status of the accommodation system, one of three, or it could be normal. And so if we look at it that way, it suddenly gets a whole lot easier. Instead of thinking about this whole massive table of what your PRA and NRE is and, and what your fuse cross seal is and your ACA and all of that sort of stuff, you can boil it down to this in your head in terms of diagnosis and treatment as well. Let me know if you have any questions at any time. Now, then we need to work out, does this problem occur at distance, at near or at both? Most of the binocular vision problems I'm dealing with are at near. That's where a kid spends most of their time reading. That's where adults spend most of their time working. So distance binocular vision problems aren't so much of an issue and we're not going to talk a whole lot about those. We're going to talk more about near BV problems and that's where you can really make massive differences for your patients. So here's a normal slide and we'll just get this into our heads before we have a look at a couple of cases. So this is all, all stuff that I don't think will be any massive surprise to you. So a near four ear is obviously meant to be one ESO to four EXO. Um, base out fusion reserves at near. There's lots of different ways to measure them. And those you might think, oh, that's a little bit low if you're used to normals being based on something like a, a Risley prism in the refractor head or doing a, a smooth vergence like this with a prism bar. So when you do a smooth vergence like this with a prism bar, it is a, it's a jump because we are jumping between steps, but that's a bit easier for the patient than if you take it off and back on again, off and back on again. And anyone who's done placement with me will know I do this. This is a bit harder, it's almost a facility test at the same time, and it will elicit problems a little more easily than if you're just going do 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 like this. Now when you do fusion or reserves through a refractor head, you can't see what's going on. And you've all done it on each other, you know it's hard, it's hard to sort of pick the the specific points, whereas you can do objective fusion reserves with this. You can see exactly what's going on and see if the um, patient's got diplopia and um, very easy to assess with this. So these normals we're giving you here that we're going to use as our reference point are for this, this sort of jump vergence where it's going on and off um, for base out, which is what I've done here, and for base in on the other eye. So NPC jump, we know that that, that should be, that's our normal result. Um, accommodation, uh, when I'm testing that with my flippers, <coughs> take my prism flippers out, okay, so I have plus minus one, 150 and two flippers here, and this is pretty much all I need for BB testing and also for RET a lot of the time as well. So if you, uh, if you add together your two and your 150, you've got minus 350, and that's a normal PRA, should be about minus 350. And then our normal NRA should be about plus two, depending on where we're testing. Obviously, if it's 33 centimetres, it'll be a little bit more than that. So it's very easy for you to put these together and do minus 350, and then plus two, and then do some cycles with your plus minus two. Really, really simple stuff. Um, we'll get a little bit later to RET and how you can really quickly and easily use these for RET. And ACA, um, you can measure that with a how card or measure at distance and near. Obviously that's a normal sort of result. I'm not going to show you heaps of ACA ratios. I'm going to focus more on what's happening with accommodation with these tests because that's really simple and a little bit more on of fusion or reserves as well. Okay, so let's focus on our vergence problems. First of all, I'm just going to show you some profiles. Welcome. I'm just going to show you some profiles of what could indicate a vergence problem. There's food over there if you want to grab any. There's still quite a bit, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if we've got an underactive virgin system, that's an exo problem. And an exo problem might be at distance and near, that's basic exo. Uh, it might be just at near, which is convergence insufficiency, or it might be just at distance, which is divergence excess. Does that make sense? You've heard all of that stuff before. Now, it could be plus or minus an accommodative disorder. So any of those accommodation problems that we talked about before could happen with a vergence problem. There are some that tend to happen more often with others, but any of them could be the case. So instead of trying to remember all of the different permutations, just think we've got one system, what's it doing, and the other system, what's it doing. 
So just to show you an example here of convergence insufficiency, we're just going to focus on these couple of simple uh, measurements here. So we've got our posture for, so our posture for our vergence system is 8XO more XO than it should be. Our petrol in the tank, our base out or convergent fusion reserves are low. Remember by Sheard's criterion, we want at least two times whatever our fourier is in our petrol in the tank, in our fusion reserves, and we don't have this for this person. Their NPC is likely to be lousy. They might fail plus. And why do they fail plus? Because it makes them more exo. So they may not have an accommodative excess. It might be that the plus makes them more exo. They might fail minus as well. The thing I want you to understand is that any combination could happen, but that actually makes it easier for you. So you're not actually having to think of which of 16 different conditions it could be. It's just these particular conditions we're looking at. And normally this in, being an insufficient problem tends to have a lower ACA ratio. Now, if we've got an overactive vergence system, that's an ESO problem. And if it's at distance and near, that's a basic ESO. If it's just at near, that's a convergence excess. If it's just at distance, that's a divergence insufficiency and we could get any flavour of accommodative disorder with it. So here's an example of a convergence excess profile, and as I just said earlier, we're going to focus more on what's happening at near, because that's more often where you're going to see these problems. So we've got euphoria that's more ESO than it should be. They're very good at converging, of course they are, because they're ESO. They're lousy at diverging, and you can see that we don't have twice as much petrol in the tank as we need to balance the posture. So again, we're likely to have symptoms. NPC should be fine, and they might fail minus because the minus makes them more ESO, but they might fail plus as well. And being an excess problem, they're likely to have an, a higher ACA ratio. So keep those in mind for when we get to our cases a little bit later on. Now, if they're both, that could be an infacility. So they might have problems with converging and diverging, with positive and negative fusion reserves, or base out or base in, depending on what terminology you use. Um, inflexibility of a spa or a spasm might be that they show fatigue or persistence of effects. So when I measure this, I'll measure their divergence first. So as I said with the prism bar, measure divergence first, and then measure convergence, and then measure divergence again. And when you do it again, that's where you can sometimes find extra fatigue. You might find the kid who's really losing their ability to diverge towards the end of the day. Once you converge them, see if they get stuck there, see if they get ESO and if they can still diverge. In the same way, you test NRA, don't you, before you do PRA. You want to see what, they, what plus they can clear before minus. So you can do the same thing, but test again to look for any fatigue effects. And quite often the simple te uh, terminology I use for parents is sticky eyes. So if they've just turned in, they want to stay turned in. If they just turned out, they want to stay turned out. They're slow to change um, position. And um, we saw a kid this morning, Charlene and I, who was just like this. We'll show his case a little bit later on. So here's a profile of a person who may have a virgence in facility. The fourier might not actually tell us what the real problem is, but our base out or convergent fusion reserves are only about half of what they should be. Our basin or divergent fusion reserves are about half or less than what they should be. And you can see there's quite a bit of fatigue between break and recovery. So that's what I'm noting there, break and recovery. Um, blur is something, information that you can get, obviously from using the prism bar. Blur is something that can be a little bit harder for the patient to tell you, particularly younger patients. And blur can tell you a little bit more about what's happening with the accommodation system. So I'm going to focus more on telling you about break and recovery because that's a little bit more focused on what's happening with virgins. Um, NPC might be fine, they might be lousy at plus or minus or both, remember we can get any flavour of accommodation problem with any flavour of vergence problem. Accommodated facility might be slow as well because the system is just frozen up and ACA might be low. Don't get too hung up on diagnosing things by ACA though because we're going to focus more on this stuff up here. Now let's have a look at our accommodation problems. So pretty simple, an underactive accommodation system can't clear minus. An overactive accommodation system can't clear plus, and if they're not clearing either, then that's an infacility or a spasm. We're not really going to have those problems at distance. Obviously, this is going to be more of an issue at near. Now, the two systems can adapt to each other, and this is why certain profiles tend to occur together more so. So if this is our object of interest, where the cross is, if we've got the accommodation system lagging behind, then the virgin system will tend to work harder to make up for it so that the object of interest is 
at the average of where those two systems are. Flip those around and you see someone with accommodation excess and convergence insufficiency. So those things quite often do happen together, the system's doing opposite things, they don't always, but in particular, as we talked about last time you were all here, a convergence excess and accommodation insufficiency are the ones that are more of our concern for myopia development and progression. So it doesn't always work that way, but quite often can. And I also want to use this just to explain why um, PRA and NRA are, are related to fusion reserves. Have you heard about this in your lectures? I know this was something that confused me as a student. So if someone isn't good at diverging, then they might also not be good at their PRA. And the reason for that is when you're testing divergence, you're keeping the plane of accommodation here and you're moving the vergence backwards. Now that's the same deal as if you're testing how well someone can clear minus. What you're doing there is you're keeping the plane of vergence here and you're moving accommodation forward. So in the same way, when someone is diverging or having to clear minus, they're putting their vergence behind their, accommod behind their accommodation, or their accommodation in front of their vergence. Does that make sense? So if somebody isn't good at diverging, they might not be good at their PRA because it's the same sort of thing they're doing with the system. It's just that the object's in the different, different spot. I'll explain it the other way around as well. So not being good at converging is related to a low NRA. Um, it presumes to call it NRA or sometimes called B plus, B minus. Negative, bless you. Negative, negative relative accommodation. So when we're testing negative relative accommodation, here's the object and we're pushing accommodation back because we're relaxing it. And when we're doing a convergent fusion reserves, we're keeping accommodation here and we're bringing vergence in. And so in the same way, we've got accommodation behind convergence just at different points in space. And that patient, for whatever reason, isn't good at putting their accommodation behind their vergence. So that's how those things are related. That isn't massively important for our clinical diagnosis, but it might be important for understanding how those things are related in exams. Or maybe more so for Megan issues. Have you finished your BB exams? Megan said fourth year. Okay, yeah, so it might not be such a big issue anymore, but it helps you to understand how those things are related. So at NIA, um, we commonly do get, so we've got accommodation insufficiency or excess vergence insufficiency or excess. We commonly do get convergence insufficiency with accommodative excess. When someone's trying to use their accommodation to drive their lousy vergence. We commonly do get convergence excess with accommodative insufficiency. And as you know, this is a risk factor for um, myopia development and progression. And this is something you can see in early presbyopia. We've got a couple of cases later as well where their convergence might start to really struggle because they're trying to use that to drive the fact that they're losing their accommodation. Someone who's got convergence insufficiency and accommodating insufficiency is going to be pretty sad looking up close, aren't they? Because neither of their systems want to look up close. And someone who's got convergence excess and accommodative excess is more likely to have pseudomyopia. So this might be the person who is ESO and they also can't clear plus. And so nothing in that system wants to relax and look back to long distance. So these are the different things that we can see. We quite often do see these ones in orange. They're sort of the cross-linked adaptations. But the thing I really want you to understand is any flavour of anything can go with any other flavour. But when you think about it this way, that's more likely to cause our symptoms at NIA. This is more likely to cause pseudomyopia problems. Um, but any of them can occur. So let's have a look at a couple of cases. Now, these are ones where we are sort of really looking at the crossover between the vergence and the accommodation systems. If we've got an ESO with an accommodative lag, we just put plus on, that fixes both, doesn't it? So these are ones a bit more complex for you because I feel like you're ready for a brain challenge. So let's have a look at these. So this is a patient in her late 30s. She was complaining about intermittently blurred distance vision and she's on a computer um, all day long for work. Her unaided vision was 6.5, but she took great pains to say it was blurry and it was hard to see. And the ret, you might think, oh, maybe she's a bit myopic. But actually, look, we've got some hyperopia here. So when we had a look at her binocular vision, we've got in her accommodation, we've got her posture, and then we've got her petrol in the tank or her stamina here. And you can see this posture is a bit lousy. That's a pretty decent lag, isn't it? 
Now we've got that plus, which is going to be part of it, but even on top of that, so sorry, this is assessed just by itself, not over the top of that, um, we've got an absolute near rate of 225. Now, she can't clear plus two or minus two, but she can clear plus or minus 150, and we can see the PRA and NRA are pretty low. So her ability to deal with this plus 225 isn't particularly good, but she's not good at clearing plus either. Now, when we have a look at her Vergence system, her Fourier distance and near are pretty normal. That's not really telling us anything useful. Her NPC is normal. That's not really useful. But if we have a look here, her base out fusion reserves are just a little bit low. So remember, normal sort of about 30. Um, her Convergence and her Divergent fusion reserves, normal's 10 to 12. They're a little bit low. Okay, so we look at that and we might go, wow, she really needs some plus. We have to be careful how much plus her give her because she's not good at clearing plus two. But we might need to see what happens over here when we give her this plus. So let's see what we did. Obviously with this near at she needs some help, but she's got a low NRA as I said. So she might not necessarily, well we can't give her plus 225 at near because she can't clear plus 225. Her distance vision problem is likely due to this accommodative infacility and she might have a bit of a spasm from that high lag. So the way I describe this to patients is you lift a heavy weight all day long and it's hard for you to put that weight down to look back to long distance. So we make the weight lighter, make it easier, and that causes less of an issue with distance vision. Okay, so if we gave her single vision distance for near use, this prescription up here, that will have a predictable effect on her accommodation, won't it? It's gonna make it easier. Pretty clear that she needs plus and pretty clear that we, if we give her one, two, five, and one, she should accept it just fine because she could clear both of those. But what will that do to her vergence? Remember both her convergence and divergence were just a little bit less than perfect. So what happened when we put that on her? Uh, remember this was her baseline measurements. The base infusion reserves divergence should improve with plus. It's just a little bit less than normal. So that's gonna predictably respond well to plus. But what about our base out or convergent fusion reserves? It may not improve with plus, and in fact, we might make it worse. So this is a really easy thing you can test. If we're thinking about prescribing her this, just whack it in a trial frame and measure your fusion reserves again with your prism bar and see what happens. And what I found is that her base out fusion reserves with the plus actually deteriorated. So we had 20 break 18 recovery. Now we have 18 break 14 recovery. So we fixed one problem, but we've made another problem worse. So what are we going to do? If we want to help her converge, we can give her base in prism. And we're going to talk about base in prism a little bit later, later on. Base in prism moves the image further away, so you don't have to converge so much to look at it. It's a relieving prism for an exo. And what adding just a little bit there, just one in front of each other, which is two in total. If that did nothing whatsoever, it would just take her from being 18 to 20. But the way I describe this to patients is like putting a brace on a weak joint. If you've got a dodgy knee and it's not working properly, you put the brace on, you can work more normally, and then your muscles get stronger. So this is something that I'll show you a couple of cases later on where these little bits of base in prism can be really your friend to help people with convergence problems. And just giving her that little bit of extra help, like the brace on the weak joint, improved her convergent fusion reserves. So her final result there, was um, plus one, two, five, one base in, and left plus one, one base in. So we've addressed her accommodation system with the plus, but we've also made sure that we haven't tanked her virgin system in the process. And what I haven't shown you there is what happened to her base in, because you might be thinking, oh, hang on, if you give her more convergence, is that gonna make that worse? And um, I'll show you that in this next case, where in fact it wasn't the issue. Okay, so for this patient, she had accommodative infacility and spasm because she couldn't clear plus or minus, that was very, very low, and she also had convergence insufficiency. And once we corrected that with the plus, we made that worse, so we had to manage that. So fixing the high lag and the accommodative infacility with plus worsened the mild convergence insufficiency. And so if we've got, if we think about there are two systems again, um, an overactive virgin system, an underactive accommodation system, ESO and a lag, both respond beautifully to plus. That's easy, we fix both systems at once. If we've got an infacility or a spasm, you might be able to put plus in them, but you might not. They might not accept plus, because they might not be able to clear it. Um, infacility of virgins and accommodative excess, again, you might have an issue not being able to clear plus. So plus isn't the answer to everything. These might need VT um, before prescribing spectacles. 
But PRISM is, and BASE in PRISM is something which can be particularly helpful for convergence insufficiency and, and more on that later. So we did both for this patient. So we helped this accommodative insufficiency and we also made sure that we didn't make the convergence worse at the same time. So it's very easy to reassess what fixing one system does to the other. Grab your prison bar, grab your flippers, trial frame, and it's very quick to measure again. Now here's bonus case that's not in your notes because he just happened this morning. Um, this little guy is nine years old and his mum came in and said his um, speech therapist had recommended an eye exam because he had a reading age of six and a half years. And mum said watching him read was like running a marathon. It was exhausting for her watching him read, let alone exhausting for the kid. His unaided vision was a little bit dodgy. You know, we might expect 6'6 minus for a kid that age, but these RETs not particularly impressive. That's really quite normal for his age. What we found with his accommodation is his near RET was 175, so that's a little bit higher than what it should be. He was really lousy at clearing minus. So he couldn't clear minus 350. A nine-year-old should be able to clear that. Couldn't clear minus two. He was a little bit slow on plus two and he was okay at clearing minus 150 slowly. He had a pretty sad accommodation um, system in terms of being able to clear minus. When we had a look at his vergence system, his foria was not much, not telling us anything particularly useful. But if you have a look at his fusion reserves, his base out fusion reserves, his convergence was really low. Remember that's meant to be about 25 to 30, and it's only 10 to eight. And his base in fusion reserves, which should be about 12, was six, um, six break and four recovery. Now, what we had here is a kid who very clearly needs plus at near. So that's very obvious. But remember, we've got a problem with convergence and divergence. So the plus will predictably help his base in, won't it? A plus will predictably make him diverge better. But plus might make his convergence worse. The interesting thing about this kid is that he was on a medication for ADHD. And a lot of medications that are, uh, are active on altering neurotransmitters can affect accommodation. And um, that's something that you'll read blurred vision, that sort of thing, in, in side effects of, of um, in, in MIMS or AMH. And it's not guaranteed, but when you do have kids on ADHD medications, um, adults on anti-anxiety, antidepressants, or kids can be on them as well, do have a look at what's happening to their accommodation. Um, because it is something that's not guaranteed, but it can occur. So for this kid, we don't know if his really profound inability to clear minus, this significant accommodative insufficiency, is because of his medication, or whether it's just because it's just him. We don't know. But what I tried first of all is plus 150 at near. So uh, if you have a look at the Myopia Profile website and in the How To section. There's um, some blogs up there, there's three blogs up there about accommodation and there'll be three blogs up there soon about virgins, how to measure them and how to prescribe for them. And there's a little flow chart I put in there on prescribing ads for accommodation problems. Generally an easy thing to start with is about plus 050 less than your near at, because you know plus 050 is a normal lag result, right? So we don't want to give them, we don't want to plus the daylights out of someone unless they're an isotropic kid and we don't care about whether they like the plus or not, because they just need it. Um, but that's a good place to start, is plus 050 less than your near ret, so that they, they are then back to a normal lag. I went a tiny bit more than that, because this kid really needed plus, so I wanted to give him a little bit more. So if I tried plus 150 at near, that's going to help his accommodation. Cool, job done for accommodation. But what's that going to do to his virgins? So when I tried plus 150 OU in front of him, he's just holding up flippers, and I'm testing his um, fusional reserves again. His base in fusion reserves, his divergence improved, that's great, we expected that would be the case. His base out fusion reserves improved as well. And look at that, you go, hang on, plus doesn't make divergence, convergence better, plus makes convergence worse. But in this case, for this kid, because his accommodation was so lousy, once we actually made stuff look clearer, he could actually converge. So don't always assume that plus is going to make an exo worse because we don't know if the accommodation or virgence is the primary problem. And that doesn't really make it more complex, it just means that you need to test and re-measure. So what we did for this kid again, I promise I don't prescribe one base in for everyone, um, but plus 150 OU with one base in 
meant there was no change to his divergence because his divergence just desperately needed this plus and his convergence improved. It's not quite perfect, but it's a whole lot better than what it was to start with. So this kid's final prescription is oh, down here, right and left plus 075 because that was his distance script with an 075 add. So we've got that 150 at near and one base in right and left. So that is helping his accommodation, his divergence, and this helps his convergence. So for this kid, the prism helps his convergence, the plus helps his divergence and his insufficiency. We've got a vergence in facility, don't we? Because both, he was sort of both underactive and overactive. And if there was nothing wrong with his accommodation, if he could clear everything perfectly fine, I don't think I would have given him glasses today. I would have probably given him prism flippers. Because if the accommodation system is fine and it's just vergence, well, there isn't any particular pair of glasses, any prescription that's necessarily going to fix up an infacility, right? We can't make glasses help someone converge and diverge at the same time. I would have probably given him prison flippers. But we had such a big problem with his accommodation and once I put that plus on him, I got to see what happened here and try different lenses to improve it. The good thing about prescribing glasses is that the compliance with the treatment is infinitely better than what it is with vision training. So 10, 15 years ago, I probably prescribed vision training heaps more than I did glasses. Um, and people were sort of compliant with it. Maybe they had more time then than they do now. But the good thing about prescribing glasses, this kid's got these glasses full time in class and then at home for homework and reading and speech therapy and tutoring and all the other stuff he's doing um, to help him learn is that these are going to be worn for six or seven hours a day or something like that. Whereas VT would be done for 15 minutes a day if we're lucky. So see what you can do with glasses because the compliance and your treatment is going to be more effective. So I just want to give you a couple of refraction tips because you've got to have a good refraction obviously before you assess what's happening with VV. So I want to tell you first of all about the blur function which is a good way to eke extra plus out of people. If you're suspicious of a bit more plus because you're seeing an ESO or the accommodation's a little bit dodgy, this is something you can try. So once you've got your red or your balanced refraction, grab a pair of, um, grab a trial frame and stick about plus two over the top of their refraction in the trial frame. Measure their binocular acuity, and it should be maybe something like 624. Then what you need to do is just slowly reduce the plus, but don't give them a chance to accommodate again. So put plus 175 in front of each eye and then take out the plus two, and then measure their acuity again. Slowly reduce the plus until you get your max plus for 66 and recheck BV. Now, Shailene and I had a chat today about Max Plus and how Max Plus is, is the ideal, the thing that we feel holy about. But Max Plus isn't actually what will necessarily work in the real world a lot of the time. If this kid is really struggling to see 66, that tells you something about what their script is, but you might not prescribe that. You might be prescribing 025 or 050 less than that to make sure they can wear it. And similarly with adults, our maximum plus changing a prescription by too much can be really difficult for a patient to adapt to. So max plus is a useful figure, um, but it might not be what you actually prescribe to ensure that a patient can wear something and that they're compliant with it. So I'll just show you this case. This is a case that came into the um, optometry clinic a little while ago when I was doing clinician work there. So she was 32 years old. She was wearing minus 275 and minus 2 contact lenses, and she was complaining that things looked small and her best corrected acuity wasn't great. So the best corrected acuity being that, you might think, oh, she's more minus. But things looking small, that's a bit of a tip off, isn't it? That she might be over minus. The amazing thing with this patient is we did this blur function and she could read 66 with plus 175 over her refraction. So that was with minus 025 and minus one, she could see 66. She's a bit hideously over minus, right? The weird thing is her BB was totally fine. You'd think she'd be ESO as anything. She was just coping amazingly well. So the management for her, she's a contact lens wearer, was slowly reducing the prescription with trial contact lenses. We can't just drop her straight down by that much. So you might drop her 0.50 or 0.75 for a couple of weeks and then a bit more for another couple of weeks. That's where contact lenses are a really useful tool for these BV problems. Similarly, if you need to up someone's plus over time, there've been kids where I've said, we're fitting you with contacts first. We're not going for glasses because we need to get things stable and it's much easier to change contact lens prescriptions than glasses prescriptions. So obviously she was an easy one. She was in the contact lens clinic, but an easy one to fix by adjusting her um, prescription. 
So refraction tip two is binocular balance. And any of you who've done placement with me have been indoctrinated in my binocular balance technique. And that's because I think it just makes sense. And I'll talk you through it and I want you to give it a go. Um, do whatever you need to do uh, in terms of your assessments for uni, but have a play with it because it does make sense. So you've finished your refraction. You've put loads of effort into it. You think, this is great. This is the best refraction I've ever done. And then you blur them plus 050 and ask the patient to pick a hole in it on 69. There might not be a hole to pick in it. There might not be a difference between the eyes because you've done this amazing refraction, best refraction of your whole life. So let's make it easy for the patient and let's give them a difference to see. So once you've got your perfect refraction, pop them on the 66 line and add plus 025 to the right eye. If it's a perfectly balanced refraction, they're going to prefer their left eye, aren't they? If that's the case, then remove that plus 025 from the right eye and add plus 025 to the left eye. And if it's a perfectly balanced refraction, they're going to prefer their right eye. Job done. If you then ask them which is better, right or left, on that perfectly balanced refraction, there's three possible answers, isn't there? Right eye might be better, left eye might be better, or they might be the same. But it's not useful information for you because you can't do anything about it. You can't give them a 0.12 correction. So if plus 025 on one eye makes them prefer the other, and 025 on the other eye makes them prefer the first, that's the job done, it's balanced. And you've given them differences to see. So they're more confident and you're more confident and there's less of that whole when you're refracting because you're giving them differences to see. However, if you add that first 025 to the right eye and the patient says, oh, I still prefer my right eye or they're the same, keep adding 025. Keep adding 025 until it makes them prefer the other eye. Then take that last one out and do the same thing to the left eye. And what you, you that's a good way to get more plus out of people and to make sure you haven't unilaterally over minus someone. So go to the point, it obviously only works if they have equal acuity, but go to the point where adding plus 025 to one eye makes them prefer the other and vice versa. Give it a try next time you're in clinic. Um, it just, it makes sense to give the patient a difference to see. And that's what we're trying to balance to make sure that we've, we've got it within 025 and then asking them to pick a difference between the actual refraction, the final binocular balance, isn't useful information because there's nothing you can do about it if they slightly prefer one eye or the other. And they might because of ocular dominance. Refraction tip three is use your RET. I love my RET, it's my most favorite. If it doesn't work, I just want to go home and cry. Same if I can't find my prison bar, I just want to go home and cry. So um, practice it on everyone because I know that it's hideously hard right now. And I remember that I had a um, clinic station exam when I was in third year because I did a four year course and one of the supervisors had made themselves minus eight with something like four lenses behind the refractor head and the ret reflex was so dim and I just wanted to burst into tears and I couldn't see it it was awful and I'm sure you've all been through this um, but ret is my most favorite tool now because it is so quick and easy and the more you practice it the easier it gets just like anything um, use your one 150 and two flippers and You've all got 150 flippers, which makes me very happy. The easy way to do this is put your 1, 150 and 2s all together. And if you get neutralization on plus 150, that's Plano. When you've got them all together like that, though you can ret anything between minus 050 and plus, plus 150 essentially. Because your minus 1, if you get neutralization on minus 1, that's minus 050 get neutralization on plus two, that's plus 050. You can flip them around and do combinations and all sorts of stuff. And that's most of what you need for a lot of these kids who might be emotropic or a bit hyperopic. For your contact lens wearers, for anyone, it's such a quick and easy way to do it. It takes a little bit of practice to flick it around. I've been doing it a long time. Um, but just give it a try because it's such an easy way to do it. And then these are all ready to go for your binocular vision testing as well. Um, for near at, Near ret's super easy, you just get the patient to fixate your nose or a, a fixated card which you attach to your ret and um, ultimately with near ret, whatever your neutralization is, that's the answer. And it's amazing how that seems really obvious but a lot of um, people graduate and go ret's hard, I'm going to ditch ret, I'm just going to do subjective and I'll use the autorefractor and that sort of stuff and forget what an amazing tool this is. So near retinoscopy, which is important for BV, important for myopia management, it's just such a simple thing to do. Get the patient to look at your nose and wave the light in front of their eyes. And it can also help you in determining, I sometimes see kids who have, you know, 075 or 1 diopter cells at distance, but those cells don't show up at near. Because remember, they accommodate and that lens might change and it might 
you know, swamp out the cell. So they might not actually need that. If you're deciding whether you need to prescribe that or not, and you're not finding that at knee, you might go, oh, well, I think they're fine at knee. We don't need that. So it's a very, very simple thing to do. Um, whatever result you get, if you get neutralization and plus 150 for near rat, that's the answer, it's plus 150. Um, there's no working distance correction. So let's talk about why PRISM is your friend. Now, basin PRISM, which I've already talked about a couple of times, is a relieving PRISM for exos and a training PRISM for esos. I think you probably all get that. Base out is the opposite. Base up and base down is most useful for vertical problems. I'm not going to talk about yoked prisms, um, two base up or two base down in each eye because that's something that, I think there's someone doing a final year project yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, so that one isn't necessarily a, an evidence-based treatment for these binocular vision problems. So we're going to talk about moving images um, further away or closer, which is what in and out do, or up and down for something like a fourth nerve palsy. So this is very easy to assess with prism flippers. So I was talking to you about those patients before, they just had one base in in each eye. So here I've got prism flippers. Does anyone own any prism flippers yet? Okay, just have a quick squizzy. But you can see they're one in each eye and two in each eye. So between those two flippers, I've got one, um, two base in, base out split, and four base in, base out split. And same as if you were going to order prism flippers for a patient to use for VT, you can order nearly any power that you want um, from these. There's a company called Cyclopean who are based out of a practice in Melbourne where you can order these from. So ultimately with PRISM we don't want to use too much. We'll get to PRISM adaptation a bit later on, but with PRISM we want to use the minimum amount which produces a quick and smooth recovery on the cover test or improves the fusion reserves as we'd intended to. And that's pretty much what I use, just ones and twos. I maybe use more than that if I've got a kid breaking into a tropia, that sort of thing, and particularly if it's one eye to try and line it up. So the real winners where you're going to find PRISM very helpful is convergence insufficiency and fourth nerve palsy. And I've got some cases of each of those. Convergence insufficiency occurs in 15-20% of kids and in 60% of young adults with near symptoms. So if you don't test BV uh, and everyone who comes in complaining of near gets plus O50, you won't necessarily be helping them. You won't be doing the job. We need to have a look at this. So for children and young adults, obviously this is characterised by low convergence. And as we said before, you can have any flavour of accommodative problem um, with the convergence problem. For presbyopes, it can cause a real problem with them adapting to their near RX because what do presbyopes do? They get more plus with time. More plus makes their exo worse. And this can influence, they might have problems with their glasses and you think, I worked hard on that refraction, I know it's fine, when in fact it might be their binocular vision. It can cause problems with them adapting to their progressives if they can't get their eyeballs down and in to actually look through the near zone of the lens. So let me take you through a case of a kid um, with convergence insufficiency where we tried some VT and that didn't work and then we used some basin prism. And this is very typical of the sort of thing I see. So we're just going to focus on his posture, his phoria, and his petrol in the tank, his fusion reserves and management, and, um, and take all of the other bits and pieces out. So we've got eight exophoria and we've got low fusion reserves. We don't have enough petrol in the tank to balance the posture, so we need to do something. We're going to try pencil push-up VT first. So that's something that you, know, you might typically um, tend to do. But do people do it? Yeah, no, not really, not really. So a, six months later, he's almost breaking into a bit of a tropia, and this is the age where an exotropia can onset, isn't it? And so things aren't getting any better at all. Okay, let's re-educate, work really hard on the pencil push-ups. You really need to do this because this is getting worse. Okay, so he comes back six months later, his four is no better, his fusion reserves have dropped back, maybe they're compliant, probably not. And so what I did is I tried two base in right and left, and I tried two rather than one just because it was a pretty bad problem. So, you know, if it's about half of fusion reserves or more, try a bit less. If it's um, less than half, less than 16, then you might want to try a bit more. So when I put that on, he improved a little bit. He got four more in each of these um, fusion reserves, his break and recovery. And his distance prescription was only plus 050, so I just prescribed that with the two base in in each eye. So that was September 2009. Okay, so this is what he was and then we reviewed him three months later. 
We can see that his foria has improved a little bit. Oh, they're together. Foria has improved a bit. His fusion reserves, which were a bit lousy last time, even with the prism on, have improved. And then another few months later, they've improved again with the prescription. And without the prescription, he's improved as well. You can see his posture has improved, and he now has enough petrol in the tank to balance the posture, just with using the prism. And then a year later, you can see that we've achieved normal fusion reserves with the glasses, nearly normal without, and this foria is much more within normal limits. So we've finished the job here. Now, this isn't something that's readily available in the literature. Um, binocular vision research isn't particularly sexy, so there isn't a lot of new stuff that comes out in this respect. And one day, I've been threatening to do this for many years, I'll do a retrospective study and publish this. But this is something I want you to play with. So even if you haven't heard about this, you're worried about prism adaptation, just take it from me that for these sorts of problems it can really work. And VT isn't something that's easy for people to comply with, particularly with increasingly busy lives nowadays. This is a very typical sort of presentation for kids. And the thing about convergence insufficiency is that once it's fixed, most of the time it stays fixed. Um, so once this kid gets back to his normal life of staring at a screen all the time, it's going to reinforce his convergence. So let's look at an adult with a convergence problem. So here we've got a patient who's got a pretty decent script, full-time glasses, um, obviously with this, but we've got a huge foria breaking into atropia and we do not have enough fusion reserves. We don't have enough petrol in the tank to balance this posture. So I gave her some loose prism VT, and if we've got a convergence problem and we need to turn the eyes in, how are we going to use the prism to train? We're going to use it base out or base in for training. We're going to use base out for training. Base out moves the image in, so that means that we're having to work those eyes harder. Whereas base in, which is what we're talking about here, I'm trying to convince you to try next year, um, is moving the image out. So that's a relieving prism for an exo. So base in, loose prism. So when we had a look at her, she was lost to follow up for a little while. Um, this didn't get any better. This got a bit worse. So now she's getting this base in prism in her glasses. So I put the base in prism, just held it up in front of her glasses, and all of a sudden, whoa, look at this, hugely improves things. So sometimes just that little bit of help is all people need, moving the image a bit further away, and their convergence improves a whole bucket load. So she was prescribed her refraction with prism, two base in right and left. And when I saw her again about a year later, her refraction was the same. She still had this pretty decent foria, but the fusion reserves were so much better and she was much less symptomatic. So this again is a typical presentation that both adults and children can have an improvement. Adults won't always respond quite as easily as kids, but their systems are flexible. So just some tips for prescribing prism. Firstly, get yourself some prism flippers that don't cost very much and you can just try this out. Um, I've also got prism flippers with just half and one base up, base down in each eye so that you can hold that up over fourth nerve people and, and see what happens to their cover test and their fusion reserves. Base in prism creates a bit of magnification <coughs> and concave distortion. So think a bit a, a little bit like what happens with the rear view mirror. Children tend to cope with that a little bit better than adults do. So I've had adults who have really bad fusion reserves. Um, they're not converging well. They're really pretty exo. And I give them prism and improves their fusion reserves, but they don't cope with the prism. So err on the side of lower for adults. Um, or, on the, or on the side of lower for everybody, but kids tend to cope a little bit better than adults if you just really need to get in there and do something about this convergence. So um, give it a go and get yourself some prism flippers. Now fourth nerve palsy is the most common cause of vertical diplopia, but hyperphoria is something that can occur in quite a bit of the population. And we'll go into that a little bit more later on. So it's something that you'll see not necessarily with the fourth nerve palsy. Obviously with the fourth nerve palsy though we have that head tilt, all these people here, this guy's got a sore neck for some reason, fundus extortion and face delay symmetry. Hopefully you can see there that the macula is lower than the centre of the nerve. So we've got fundus extortion, um, actually it's that way isn't it, that's in torsion for that eye. But that's what we're looking at is whether the macula is in line with the optic nerve or not and we can see it isn't in this case. Um, spot the fourth nerve palsy in this family picture. Look at that. Okay, spot the fourth nerve palsy here. Look, even Dolly's got a fourth nerve palsy. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Dolly's got the opposite. Dolly's right hyper, this is left hyper, this family picture. Um, so, 
you can sometimes notice vertical phorias though in people if they have massive horizontal phorias. So primary horizontal phorias can have small vertical deviations if they're massive. So if you're seeing a little bit of that, sometimes just a tiny bit of vertical prism, um, half in each eye, again you can get that in flippers, you just got to make sure you get your base up and base down the right way around with your flippers, um, can, ha can actually help their horizontal fusion. And somebody who's got a uh, superior oblique palsy, remember, I remember Swanee saying these are your dinner plate muscles, your down and in muscles. So they're not going to be good at converging and they're also going to have that vertical problem. So some, sometimes a little bit of vertical help can improve their convergence as well. Now primary vertical phorias, if you've got a huge massive fourth nerve palsy, can become compensated with correction for coexisting horizontal phoria. So again, the convergence insufficiency that we have in this person with the fourth nerve palsy, well you might make it easier for, manage, for them to manage their vertical component if their horizontal component is closer to normal. So all of this stuff sounds terribly scary and you think, oh, I don't want to see this in a patient next year, but you're going to. Grab yourself some prism flippers and you know how to test it. You've just got to think through it logically. So prism adaptation, you might think, oh, I can't prescribe prism ever because it's going to kill people. Um, it's not going to kill people. Um, and prism adaptation tends to happen in people with normal BV. So if you've got normal BV and we stick a bunch of base in prism on you for a while, that's going to change your convergence. But if you don't have normal BV, this is something that you can do to help. So you can do a pre-prescribing prism adaptation test where you can just do a two to three minute trial to see if the heterophoria, if it improves, and then if it starts to increase again, that indicates prism adaptation. Um, but ordinarily, this is not something that happens in people with abnormal BV. Now, if somebody's got a fourth nerve palsy, that tends to get a bit worse with time. So they're going to need a little bit more prism with time. This is talking about from childhood to adulthood to middle age. So that is something that is quite normal. That isn't necessarily prism adaptation. Uh, but there's an easy way to test for that. So prism adaptation does decrease a little bit with age. So older patients are more likely to do better if you give them prisms than VT. And also older patients just won't do VT because <laughs> they're doing other stuff. Um, however, multiple prism corrections are likely in most patients, and that's particularly with, with um, vertical problems. So don't be too worried about this and these little bits that we've talked about, ones and twos for convergence insufficiency, it's not going to be an issue. Um, just keep testing the kids with and without their glasses and you'll see that they improve in both cases. Vertical uh, is superior oblique, um, palsy is a lifelong problem and that will likely get a little bit more so with time. So prism is your friend, hopefully feel a bit more warm towards prism. BV and contact lenses. So when we look through um, myopic spectacles, we get base in prism at near because see here's the thick part of the lens and the thin parts here and there's less accommodative demand. So you look away from the optical centre of a spectacle, a minus lens and it gets less powerful. So when this person changes to contact lenses, they have an exo shift because all of a sudden this base in prism they had before they've lost and they have to work harder and there's more accommodative demand. So for this reason, um, the myop who changes from specs to contact lenses has to work their vergence and accommodation system harder. Um, this has been shown, high accommodate, higher accommodative lags have been found in single vision contact lens wearers compared to spectacle lens wearers. And um, there have been exophoric and exotropic shifts after LASIK. Imagine that, you go get your LASIK for your minus 10 and then you end up exotropic. So this is something that we do need to consider. Obviously we get a larger image size in myopic contact lenses as well. And that's something that, you know, your minus eight, minus nine kid um, can get an improvement from that. Actually, I'll tell you about a patient of mine who has Marfans. So he has lens subluxation in each eye. His best corrected spectacle acuity, his script's about minus nine with a two sill, is about six, nine and six, 12. So he's lucky that he's going to be able to drive, but six, nine and six, 12 isn't particularly great. Um, when I first talked to, I took a few goes to sort of get mum and dad interested and welcome of the idea of, of wearing contact lenses and they had misconceptions such as his vision would be worse in the contacts. I said no, it's going to be better because his image size will be bigger and that it wouldn't be safe and all of this sort of stuff. So we dealt with all of that. Um, once he realised that he was going to be a contact lens wearer, he was about 15 at the time, he got up and started pacing the room, he was so excited and his acuity has improved. So with the contact lenses, he's 6'7", 6'7 minus and 6'9". 
And that's not amblyopia, right? That's, that's lens subluxation. But just having a bigger image size means the bit of the image he's seeing through his lens um, has actually improved his acuity. And he loves being a contact lens wearer and he's not going to be a glasses wearer ever again. He tells me that every time he comes in. So this larger image size is something that was really important for him and has made a big difference to his acuity. So the myopic contact lens wearers you need to be a little bit aware of in terms of their BV is the early presbopic myope. And you've probably encountered these already. It's always easier to read in your specs than in your contact lenses. And the minus eight in their specs might never need an ad. Whereas if you put them into contact lenses, they're gonna need an ad at the same time everyone else needs an ad, um, you know, 43 to 45. Um, keep in mind also that the say a minus three in specs will go. I had one just at the end of the day. I can read, I can, but I can read really well without my glasses up close. Yes, you'll always be able to do that. That's the good thing about being myopic, and that's sometimes a problem in that they think, well, nothing's as good as this. And um, so keep in mind if they're taking their glasses off to read that that's something you need to manage um, when they go into contact lenses. The low myope was previously uncorrected at near, um, so I'm minus one. I have lousy accommodation. I hardly ever wear my glasses for reading. I know I'm making it worse for myself when I become a presbyte, but I don't want to wear them to read. So if you put me in single vision contact lenses, I'm not going to feel as comfortable at near um, when I've been uncorrected all the time. And we know that um, risk factors, bless you, for myopia progression are accommodative lag and esophora in higher ACA ratios. So we might be making these things worse, well, make the accommodative lag worse when we switch them to contact lenses. We can make an ESO better when we switch to contact lenses. So keep those things in mind. Now it's the opposite for a hyperope. So when they look at near, when they converge through the center of their lenses, they get base out prism at near. See the thick part of the lens is here. It's thin, um, in, thin at the center and there's more accommodative demand because of the power of the lens. So when they change to contact lenses, they get an ESO shift in their contacts and less accommodative demand. So if they're already ESO in their glasses, it's going to get worse when they change to contact lenses. So they need to decrease their vergence and accommodative response. They get a smaller image size in contact lenses. If you've had someone who's, I've had patients who are minus, oh, sorry, plus three, plus four, plus five, who just, you have to talk them into glasses over a period of years, and when they finally get a pair of glasses, they go, everything's so big, I can't wear these. Yes, I know this is why you'll always want to be a contact lens wearer. Um, but that can be a benefit of some, to some people as well. So for our hyperopic contact lens wearers, watch out for the early presbyopic hyperope. Um, you just watch out for early presbyopes all the time because they're just not happy people a lot of the time. <laughs> and none of us will be happy when we're early presbyopes either, even though we knew it was coming. So it's easier for them to read in the contact lenses because the accommodation demand is different, but they lose that spectacle magnification. The latent hyperope with esophoria is the one who you need to be a bit aware of because they'll get an esophoric shift with their contact lenses. But if they're a latent hyperope, and this is maybe more so the, the young um, hyperope who just can't accept their plus, fit them with contacts before you actually go for glasses because you can slowly increase the power with the contact lenses. So the people, this is just a summary, you've got it in your notes. The myopes to watch out for are the early presbyopic myope, the low myope who's not used to their correction at near, and risk factors for, for progression. And with hyperopes, watch out for the early presbyopic hyperope. And contact lenses can be a really useful tool for the latent hyperope. Now, I just want to talk you through one case of using multifocals for non presbyopes. And we actually saw her today, shall we? Um, so, this um, patient is concerned about progression of her myopia. She was 30 at the time and still progressing, um, 025, 050 per year. She showed esophora and accommodative lag. And as we know, these are risk factors for myopia progression. So we did a head-to-head -head trial of true eye, um, single vision lens, versus pro clear multifocal with a distance center. Um, and then and she's actually ended up in something slightly different. But what we actually found is that when she was in the multifocal lens, as compared to the single vision, her ESO was less and her lag was less. And that makes sense, right? It makes sense that we give someone a multifocal, that's going to help. Now, she's not really tolerant of a monthly lens, she's actually in daily disposables. And all of our daily disposable multifocals are near-centered, aren't they? Except the MySight, which is a myopia contact lens rather than a multifocal as such. So she's wearing a um, near-centered multifocal right now. She's coping quite well with that in terms of her acuity. 
despite the fact that she's not a presbyop, she's 37 now, and her binocular vision results are still similar to this, and much more comfortable for her at near, staring at a computer all day, compared to what it was with single vision. So she liked the comfort of a daily better and liked the distance vision, but she felt that for what she was doing most of the day, her near vision felt better in the multifocal. So don't be afraid to try um, multifocals for presbyopes when you've got a BV problem. So make sure you're considering the optical difference between specs and contacts when you're troubleshooting issues, particularly in these patients to be aware of, particularly the early presbyope because they're just generally cranky about life. Um, and the add-in multifocal contact lens is, isn't the same as in a pair of glasses. Um, one piece of research has shown that it's about half of the add power. But it might give you the full add in some people and no add in other people. Um, but it is something you can use. If you've got someone who's a, a die-in-the-wall contact lens wearer, but they're having these problems staring at the computer all day long, uh, keep it in mind, you can use these in non-presbyotes to help their BV. Um, make sure, you, though, you prepare these young myopes to accept distant so soft focus, because if anyone else is a myope here, you know that we don't like having any blur for distance because we're fussy about it, we've suffered it for a long time. So we do need to prepare them for that, that what we're doing with these contact lenses is making it easier to see at the computer, which is going to make less um, issue with you being able to see back to long distance at the end of the day. Okay, so why BV matters? I think you all know why BV matters or you wouldn't be here, but I'll just do a little bit more just to convince you and bring it home. BV matters because it gives us information about learning difficulties, it's important in myopia control and for clinical problem solving too. Now I'm sure you've sort of heard of this hierarchy of vision. Visual clarity is how clearly we can see and if you just stop there you're going to find optometry boring and you're not going to be doing everything for your patients that you can. So when you start looking at visual efficiency life gets so much more interesting because nearly all of your patients will have two eyes, I'll tell you that right now. Some of them have one, nobody has three. My first patient when I graduated had one eye. Um, and I sort of got a bit confused about what I had to do in the eye exam because he only had one eye. I'm like, but covetous, no. Um, <laughs> pupils, just one eye. Accommodation, yeah, yeah. It was just totally threw me off. I'll never forget my first patient with one eye. But most of your patients have two eyes, which means they have binocular vision. Um, then if you're looking at visual information processing, I'm not the person to tell you about that, but that's looking at how the software works. We've focused more on how the hardware works, the stability of information going from the eyes to the brain. What's happening with the software is also complicated a lot more by the individual child, for example, when it comes to learning difficulties, what they're good at, what they're not good at. I just put this in here to give you a little bit of an idea of what unstable binocular vision might look like. So if you're not aiming your eyes at the page properly, a child may not be seeing like this all the time, but <clears throat> they might be sometimes seeing that it's a line, sometimes not. It makes you feel a bit nauseous, doesn't it? So that's something that can be helpful to explain to parents. Little Freddie isn't seeing double all the time, but it is something that um, moves around on him, makes it uncomfortable to look at. No one wants to do that. There's a link between ADHD and convergence insufficiency. You might have heard about this already. There is a couple of studies that have found that um, kids with ADHD are more likely to have convergence problems. And this was our kitty we had this morning. Um, and vice versa as well. And there was a study done about, or a bit over 10 years ago, um, it was an ophthalmology study that said at least 15% of the children who were diagnosed with ADHD, they might not have been diagnosed with that if convergence insufficiency had been diagnosed first. That's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? And if something is hard to do, we want to work out a way to avoid it. Um, and that avoidance behaviour is something that might be diagnosed when in fact the root cause might be vision it might be convergence insufficiency. So these authors actually said the presence of convergence insufficiency may cause a misdiagnosis of ADHD. So we've got a really powerful role to say we can't clear, we can't cure ADHD, but we've really got a powerful role to play to make sure that everything's normal with this visual system with the hardware before we infer what's going on with the software. Children with convergence insufficiency have a higher frequency of behaviour issues related to school performance and attention, and of course these things could be therefore confused with the diagnosis of ADHD. And reduced convergence ability is correlated with reduced reading speed. So when we um, saccade across a page, um, each one of those fixations is less accurate when we've got a BV problem and there's more that are done. So it's like lifting a weight and you have to lift the weight so many more times. So of course the child's going to fatigue more um, when we've got a problem like this. Now myopia control, we know that we've got the most runs on the board in the contact lens arena, 
but spectacles are useful as well when we're looking at specific binocular vision um, populations. And myopes are known to have a greater frequency of inaccurate accommodation and convergence of behaviour. You've heard me say esophorian accommodative lag 1600 times, and I'm going to say it again because it's very important um, for myopia management. Um, kids who are becoming myopic have shown higher ACA ratios in the year prior to becoming myopic and greater variability in accommodative responses. So we do need to watch for these when we've got a pre-myope or a myopic kid. So as we talked about last time, progressive lenses applied to everyone have pretty unimpressive effects for myopia control, but when they're targeted more to kids with esophorian accommodative lag, we get more reasonable results. And some of the results end up being up near where some of the contact lenses are. So you can still manage myopia effectively with glasses. Prescribing single vision glasses to a progressing myope with ESO and lag though isn't evidence-based. Prescribing progressives is in that particular case. Now, if you try and change binocular vision in terms of myopia control in contact lenses, as I mentioned before, our bifocal soft lenses, our distance-centered multifocals, which we know people are using for myopia control, do reduce lag um, by about half of the ad power. Ortho K increases accommodative responses, um, and this is to do with a shift in positive spherical aberration. I talked a bit about aberration last time, so we won't get into it again. Um, there was a study done a couple years ago that found ortho K increased accommodative amplitude by about two and a half diopters after two years of wear in Chinese kids. And they found that the kids who were low, below average accommodators actually had the greater myopia control result. So their axial elongation was only 56% as much as the kids who were normal accommodators. So for the kid who's a lousy accommodator, maybe managing their BV is the biggest thing for them in terms of myopia control. For the kid who's a normal accommodator, maybe it's more to do with their peripheral optics or whatever the mechanism of atropine is. That's what we're going to learn more of with time. And ortho K wearing children and young adults have shown decreased accommodative lags and more exophoria compared to soft contact lens wearers, and that's my um, PhD research. So a, it's easier for an early presbopic myope to read in ortho K than it is in single vision. And it's easier for a kid, particularly the ESON accommodative lag kid, uh, they're going to have better BV in ortho K than they will in single vision lenses. But again, single vision contact lenses prescribed to a progressing young myope isn't evidence-based either. Um, we need to prescribe a multifocal or a myside or ortho K if they're wanting to wear contact lenses. So specs are sometimes better than contact lenses for myopia control. If we've got severe vergence disorders, we can get a consistent full strength out of um, specs, which we can't necessarily get out of contact lenses. Um, but we know that bifocal soft lenses and ortho K will reduce the lag a little bit. And remember, as I've said before, this is the 17,000th time, it's a foreign lag of the things you need to watch for. So if BV is normal, go straight for contact lens options if the patient is suitable for contact lens wear. If it's not normal, you might need to wear, um, put the patient in glasses to control things better. And I might have mentioned last week some kids I'll get who've got big exotropias. And if we don't fix that exotropia, that eye just gets more and more myopic from, from form deprivation. So myopia control for that kid will be actually managing their BV, not fitting them with contact lenses because that will make it worse because we get that exo shift. Okay, and as I said last week, the sooner you start, the better with myopia control because progression is um, more as they're younger. You're going to have a greater effect on progression when you start earlier. Now, the last areas where BV is problem, um, can help you is with this clinical problem solving. So here's just four patients you might have seen lately. The patient who's not adapting to progressives. Can you see this patient, this eye's converging, this eye's pointing out towards me? So she's going to have problems wearing her progressive lenses um, because she can't get, she's not looking through the actual near bit. And so in that case, managing the convergence is something that will help her. You might, she might come back and you think, the glasses are adjusted wrong, it's the wrong lens design, my script's wrong, something like that, and it might just be her BV. Um, Non-adaptation non or astenopia with a latent hyperope. So this is a presbyopic patient who can't accept her full distance prescription. She's got a decent amount of plus. And because she can't accept her full distance prescription, she's struggling at near. She needs that plus, doesn't she? But she can't deal with it. So her current single vision distance prescription was this. And if we have a look at her convergence is fine, her divergence is completely dodgy, and she can't clear plus. And you might think, what 46-year-old can't clear plus? They should love plus. 
they should lap up my plus that I give them. Um, but in fact, she couldn't clear that. This problem is convergence excess and accommodative spasm. So she actually needed vision training. Um, we did a lot of base in. So base in moves the image out. It forces her to diverge to get her to accept her full prescription. And if you didn't have that BV information, you're just trying to whack more plus in front of her, wouldn't you? And um, she's not coping with it because we've got a BV problem. So this is a patient with presbyopic symptoms, but low or no near add. This might be the patient who puzzles you a bit and you think, oh, I'll just give you plus A50 at near, but that won't fix the problem. So she's 39, she's not old enough to be a presbyope, she's struggling at near, and this is her um, BV results. So she's got a pretty low refraction, her convergence is completely dodgy, her exo is huge, so we definitely don't have enough petrol in the tank to balance the posture. In fact, we've got less than half, and that should be more than double. Um, we can see that she can clear minus 175 on her PRA. So she's not a presbyope, is she? The presbyope isn't going to clear minus 175. The problem is actually convergence insufficiency. And if we don't do anything about this, how do you think she's going to cope with a future ad? Not going to like it at all. She's just going to be unhappy with the glasses and unhappy without the glasses. So we actually did loose prism VT for convergence insufficiency. Base out moves the image in, makes her converge more, trains that, that vergence. And a patient with intermittent, intermittent distance pleur. This is a patient where you might think, okay, she needs a change in her glasses, she's 43. She says sometimes she's totally blurry long distance and then it recovers with rest. So here's her profile. She can converge like nobody's business. She's lousy at diverging. Look at that, we've got a negative recovery, which means I had to put more base out prism in front of her before she could actually recover single vision. Her foria is ESO, and we definitely don't have enough petrol in the tank to balance her posture. And down here, her PRA and, NR, PRA and NRA are a bit low, but that PRA isn't so bad for someone who's 43. So it's not presbyopia, is it? It's her binocular vision. Maybe this started to be a problem because her accommodation is failing, but this is the primary thing we need to fix. So this is convergence excess, and we did um, vision training for that. You might prescribe glasses, do things differently now, but it's just to point out that all of these people here are binocular vision problems, not refractive problems, and you're likely to see these people. So vision is much more than acuity. Um, hope, that's my real take home message. This is meant to make you feel weird and uncomfortable um, because we can get patients who feel weird and uncomfortable and they'll be six, five either eye. So my real message is make sure that you take all of this stuff um, in and that you apply it next year and grab things to make it easier and faster for you like plus minus flippers and like the prison flippers so you can test these things. Um, and you've all got a copy of the lecture notes. There's more stuff on binocular vision on my website and we've talked about my APR profile as well to, to get more of the picture in, in view of my APR. Thanks so much guys, thanks so much. Any questions, or is everyone mind boggled? Yeah? Um, you know, if we could dive on how you gave him prism and then his convergence came back up to scratch, would you then take the prism away? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what I tend to do is if they've got to a point where their vergence is fine um, with and without the glasses, what I might tend to do is say, okay, now for one or two terms, you're just going to wear them at home for homework and reading when you're tired, and then you're going to stop for one or two terms. So you might do at home for a term and then stop for a term and come and see me in six months' time so you can see that they're managing. And the only kids I've seen regress are the ones who've been really bad, you know, tr almost tropic sort of cases to start with. But, yeah, they don't need it forever, and it is a training tool. You can get to the point where they don't need it anymore. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks so much, guys. Hope you enjoyed the subway. And um, we have another lecture next year, week, which is all about contact lenses in an hour.